Good evening, this is Ryan. We got a special Saturday night edition of Studying for HM1. Today I'm going to be covering BUMED instruction 6220.9 Bravo. As I said in the previous video, I'm going to try to focus on just using the name of the instruction because that helps me a lot because I have a bad memory with remembering numbers. So I'm going to try to review it or refer to it as its number as much as possible. Now I'm going to be looking down because today I have the instruction printed out old school. I'm not looking at the PDF, so I may be looking down a lot. So enjoy the view of my forehead. Um, before I get kick things off, I would like to thank you for the three people that I see subscribed to my channel. Um, Angel, Jesse, and Samantha. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully this helps um, your guys' growth and development. If you could think of any feedback for me to improve my study hygiene or skills, I would love it as well if there's anything you think from this instruction I didn't cover that I should. The big thing about this instruction is it's focused on healthcare, infection prevention, and control program, but it kind of throws like a bait and switch because there's enclosures of this, enclosures in this instruction that you wouldn't even guess is in here if you didn't read the enclosures. Like for example, there's a whole chapter in the back about dental cleaning, dental lab stuff, which I'll cover that in a minute. But remember for this instruction, like half of it is in the enclosure and all of that is the dental stuff. Um, because for the most part, the first half of the instruction, I'm gonna flip through it as I'm talking on the video. The first half of it is pretty common sense stuff, I think for most corpsmen. Um, for example, Wear your gloves clean. There's some admin stuff that I'm gonna go over. Um, for example, budget submitting office BSO 18 is basically what Navy medicine stuff is referred to from the bean counter money angle. I don't know exactly what a BSO is, but I know in all the instructions for Navy medicine, BSO, t BSO 18 is Navy medicine. So if you ever hit a question where it's like, what's the BSO? I mean, maybe there's other ones, but I think of all the instructions that I've read, BSO 18 is the only one that I think is pertinent for us. So every hospital needs an infection prevention program because we work at a hospital and getting a disease is bad. Um, the, the CO is in charge to make sure that there's an IP program that is being followed. Here's, one, here's a number one on the second page, it says anyone that comes within three feet of patients needs to have their flu shot. So I think with all the six feet COVID drama, just think half that. So three feet, if you're within three feet of patients, regardless of your job, you're getting a flu shot. The healthcare pro or the healthcare infection prevention control program covers all aspects of healthcare operations. So they look at everything. Um, their job is to look at the entire hospital for anything that could possibly get someone infected from food service to supply to health care, anything that someone could get in contact with grody stuff. So there's zero tolerance for health care acquired infection, which I'll define that more later because there's another section of the instruction that goes over um, definitions. See, pretty much every um, health care infection issue needs to be reported up the totem pole. Uh, the healthcare committee needs to have access to all the incidences. They report directly to medical, infectious diseases, or dental, um, as well as patient safety, risk management, quality management as needed. They need to know how the hospital works, and they need to support the hospital in any healthcare um, acquired infection prevention stuff. I'm looking on page five of the instruction. Here it says any cleaning, disinfect, disinfecting, and sterilization of reusable and medical equipment must be managed by internal centralized training program that's conducted by SPD. I like to think of that as SPD is where all the stuff gets cleaned, all the metal stuff. I've never been a search tech or a dental tech, so a lot of this instruction is stuff that I've just heard and studied in other regs, so I've never actually physically worked with a lot of this stuff. But SPD are the people that you give them their your instruments, they clean it and do all their wizardry behind the OR, and then they give you back other stuff in peel packs. Um, I'll probably cover that a lot more in detail when I'm looking at the Corman Manual um, Clinical Support Service stuff. Um, it says that the SPD, it should be certified, but it's not required per the instruction. It says certification of the SPD SME is desirable, but may not always be feasible. 
So it doesn't have a hard and fast, it needs to be certified. However, there needs to be something in the training record for the staff that are certified to work with dirty stuff. Any critical or semi-critical single-use devices should be discarded after use, which makes sense because it's single-use. Um, if anything is single-use, it should be discarded after use. And any non-critical single-use devices that are reprocessed by a third-party processing facility must comply with FDA. So in that weird off-site area where you can reuse a double or double use a single use thing and it's done off site, they have to be approved by the FDA to do it. See, so for dental water stuff, um, this is just baseline for drinking water. There needs to be EPA standard of less than 500 colony forming units per millimeter, which is known as CFU slash ML. From what I understand when I Google that is there's a certain amount of gross stuff that's allowed to be in water and still be drinkable water. And that magic number for the gross stuff is 500. So the 500 is a hard cutoff for how much gross stuff should be in water. And that is 500 colony forming units per millimeter. Here's some program requirements for the committee of healthcare acquired infection prevention. They need to have program objectives that reflect the MTF. So for example, if I have a bunch of um, objectives that are specific for dental, but I don't have a dental clinic. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, they need to be organized. Um, they need to have a designated infection prevention person who reports directly to medical infection diseases or dental as needed. They do an annual report and they do an annual performance improvements plan. And then for education for healthcare, Healthcare acquired infection prevention control education. Um, it needs to be provided for new employees, new residents, new interns, new medical staff. Um, it doesn't say specifically how often the training needs to occur, but it does say that there needs to be orientation. I would get let, well, most of that stuff is done annually, so it's probably found in other instructions, but it's not specified in this one. Then responsibilities, which is something to always pay attention in these type of instructions. So there is a BUMED infection control consultant. Their nomenclature in this instruction is known as BUMED TAC M3 slash five. I don't think I've ever seen that asked, but when we cover the, um, the Navy medicine organization, the BUMED organization, which I'm trying to remember the name of it, but that's the one that lists like tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. There are a few questions that I've seen like on Blue Jacket tier where it's like, what is BUMED M1? Who is M2? So if you remember that infection prevention is M3 slash five, hey, if it's multiple choice and they're asking like who the CNO is or who the um, chief of BUMED, their code, you see three and five, you know that's not the right answer. So it may help with the elimination for um, other questions. Their job is to interpret DOD policies and provide guidance. Um, they implement and coordinate medical and dental programs and fixed, which is shore based with permanent structures, MTFs. And they provide any um, consultation, education, support, and any HAIPC related information to Navy MTFs and DTFs. Here's the responsibility, and they also uh, maintain a database. Responsibilities for the NPF, MTF and DTF. Gotta love trying to study on a Saturday night. MTF and DTFs need to have established an IP program. The CO is the one who's going to appoint a um, committee known as the Infection Prevention Control Committee. And that committee includes a chairman as well as a representative, representative from each of the major clinical services. So I said in my other video, you wouldn't want to have a big group of dentists doing like immunization stuff. You want to have as many specialties as possible so they can take a look. Um, however, here it specifies that the three major clinical services are dental, medical, and surgical. Surgical. So again, dental, so stuff with the teeth, medical, stuff with the body, surgical, chopping into people. The chairman needs to be either a physician or a dentist who is involved in clinical practice, so it needs to be someone that is still clinical, not doing admin stuff. Let's see, and they have knowledge or interest in infection prevention or infectious disease. So you kind of want someone in charge that knows a lot about infectious stuff. For the commander, 
There's some numbers in here I don't quite understand, so I'm going to do a little bit more research on my side to find out exactly what these things mean. But I do see that at a minimum, and this is on page 7 of the instruction, at a minimum, each inpatient MTF, so inpatient only, should have an infection prevention position that is a 1.0 full-time equivalent to oversee the program. Additional IPs at a ratio of 0.8 to 1.0 FTE are advised for every 100 occupied acute care beds or a portion thereof. So how I'm seeing it is everyone needs to have 100%, so 1.0. Um, but if they have a lot of beds, so over 100 occupied acute beds, another 80 to 100% per. Doesn't really make sense to me, but I will try to remember those numbers and look more up, look more on that up later. Hopefully one of the other instructions has more info on that. It also says that and or 1.0 full-time equivalent for managing 30 to 40 ICU beds. Um, I think that's probably important to know, um, 30 to 40 ICU beds, because the ICU people are like the super, super sick ones. So it makes sense that if there's a lot of people in ICU, it would be a lot lower number than the one for every 100 beds. Let's see. And it also says freestanding ambulatory care facilities, including DTFs, must have a recommended staffing of at least one full-time equivalent IP for up to 200,000 ambulatory care or dental visits per year. How I'm reading that is um, like the FTE. I think that's similar to like what percentage of your job is doing that job. So for example, if someone has like 100 different hats and infection prevention is like the thing they focus the least on, wouldn't really be a 100% FTE. However, I'm not sure. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, the cool thing about active studying is trying to learn this kind of stuff. So hopefully I'll take some time. I know for me, PrevMed and Supply are the ones I always score the worst at. So I'm probably going to spend a lot of time focusing on that later. Let's see. And that's really it for the rest of um, that instruction. However, as I said earlier, there are definitions and then there's also that dental manual at the end. So for definitions, I think the big ones to understand are the difference between critical, semi, or oh, can't really see my fingers, critical, semi-critical, <laughs> and uh, non-critical devices. So a critical device is anything that cuts into somebody. So for me, what helps is I think critical is anything that would need to be sterile. Um, the examples they provide in the book are instruments, so knives, urinary catheters, implants, ultrasound probes, anything that would go in a sterile body cavity. So, and because of that, it needs to be sterilized. So I think critical, something that goes inside the body that's actually cutting and needs to be sterile. So sterile critical. Non-critical device, which for mom reading this one, this is one that usually used to trip me up, but after reading it in the instruction, it seems pretty common sense. Um, Non-critical is stuff that doesn't go inside the patient. So bed cover, um, bed pan, blood pressure cuff, bed rail, bedside table, furniture. Pretty much all the stuff is common we wipe down between encounters. Um, it says here that they can be cleaned by an EPA registered low level disinfection. So just think low level, clean the room. And then we have the third one, which is semi-critical devices. I'm reading this as mostly stuff that goes in a mouth. So the examples that they provide are GI endoscope, bronchoscope, laryngoscope blades, esophageal mimetry probe, endocavitary probe, cystoscopes, and a bunch of other stuff that I don't know what it means. Um, however, it's stuff that's not physically getting cut into the side of somebody. Um, it defines them as any that these are things that need to be free from all microorganisms. However, a very small number of bacterial spores may be present. So it needs to be clean. It doesn't need to be sterile. Um, they need high level disinfection using chemical disinfectants. So it's high level. It's not uh, sterilized, but it's high level disinfection. And then and this is enclosure two. The only other big thing aside from the critical, semi-critical, non-critical is to look at the difference in healthcare or healthcare associated infection. So in the other video, a nosocomial infection is 72 hours after admission. However, a healthcare acquired infection is any infection that happens 48 hours after the time of admission or treatment. So for me that at first that was really confusing because I tried to Google it and I didn't really see 
a difference. Like a lot of my research I saw, or <laughs> I refer to Googling as research, is I saw that a lot of people would use nosocomial versus healthcare associated almost interchangeably. And I couldn't find anything that defines what the difference is. But however, in the instructions, and that's what our bibs are off of, I saw in the first instruction I did, nosocomial is 72, healthcare acquired is 48. So they may try to trip us up on that. I don't think I've ever seen a question that asks one or the other, but just something to remember, tool for the toolbox. See, enclosure three is a bunch of acronyms. I don't really see anything in here that's super important. Um, IPCC, because that's the big one in charge of the program. Infection Prevention and Control Committee. I think I said that wrong a couple times earlier in the video. And then for the enclosure four is the big boy. Enclosure four is like, bigger than the instruction itself. I think it's really interesting that it's not its own instruction. And this is all dental. So chapter one, dental treatment room, infection control, procedures and considerations. Chapter two, infection control in the dental lab. Chapter three, infection control in the dental radiography. Chapter four, references. Seems like a lot, but I know for the Navy advancement exam, normally they ask maybe some numbers, forms, stuff like that. So I didn't really see anything here that I think would be super important to know, but I'll I'll go through a couple of things that I underlined. And again, if there's stuff that you think is important, just throw it in the comment. Um, on the introduction, it basically talks about how dental is important because people, there's a lot of spit and aerosols that shoot out when doing dental stuff. So it's easy to forget to clean. I like to think of it kind of, I mean, this is kind of gross, but like popping zits or scratching your face in front of a mirror, you get like the little gross stains on it. If you don't clean it, it builds up and gets really, really gross. I like to think about dental procedures like that. Um, it defines an aerosol as particles less than 10 microns in diameter and are not typically visible to the naked eye. So that's why it's so important to clean because there's like this accumulation of just these really tiny particles, which by themselves aren't that much. But if you figure you're doing 30 to 40 procedures a day or however many you do in your clinic, stuff adds up. Let's see, chapter one, it has, a, I mean, I think all of us are pros at washing our hands. Thank you, 2020. Um, it does specify in this ins in this instruction that you begin each day with a hand wash of 15 seconds and the hand wash needs to go from the tip of the fingertip to the wrist. So not too high up there, but to your wrist. Also says again, here's the EPA. So if you're using any water in the dental treatment room, it needs to have less than 500 colony forming units. Again, if it shows up multiple times in instruction, maybe it's important, I don't know. Infection prevention is like the least I normally score, so please do let me know. But I think with how many times I said 500, I'm probably gonna remember that now. See all the other stuff like wash your hands, don't be gross. Um, use your one-handed scoop technique. If you don't know what that is, bad Corman. Um, know what your one-handed scoop technique is for recapping a needle. Um, it talks about so here's what you do with an instrument after doing a dental thing. So wear your appropriate gloves, PPE, while you're handling dirty equipment. Um, place all designated sharps in your um, sharps container. Dispose of all non-sharps, so do your basic cleaning. Instruments may be wiped carefully with the moist gauze. I know the, um, the SPD guys really hate it when you give them the stuff with the really nasty crusties on it. I remember that back from my derm days. We had to spray it with stuff, wipe it off, the fancy $5 word for that is called bio burden. I like to think about it as just the nasty crusties that are all over the equipment. But if you've worked in anything doing like cutting in or using equipment, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the, the goop that is on the equipment. So you spray it, you wipe it down. You put it in the cassette tray, which is just that red tray that we put our um, stuff in. Critical and semi-critical items must be heat sterilized after cleaning. So you clean it first and then heat sterilize. And then this is here for flushing your water. So flush water and air for 20 to 30 seconds after each patient. I think I've seen that before, maybe. I've taken the exam a lot of times. That sounds familiar to me. So 20 to 30 seconds after each patient. I think maybe 20 to 30 seconds was also in the dental chapter in the book. I don't know, but I've definitely seen that somewhere before in my life. Um, even if you're using something called anti-retraction valves, which given context, I'm assuming that means the water can't go back in it you still need to flush it for 23, 20 to 30 seconds. Clean your eyewear and all other equipment. 
And that's really it for chapter one. So basic just cleaning after a procedure. Chapter two is dental lab. It says in here that the two most common, again, most common, so whenever you see an instructor say most common, that's pretty important. The two most common patient care items that rely on dental laboratory support are prostheses and oral impressions. So prostheses, prosthesis, multiple prosthesis and oral impressions. It says that these can um, carry multi or microorganisms for up to a week. So gross stuff can live on that for a week. So kind of important. Again, it says in here most commonly. So let me just say it one more time for emphasis. Prostheses and oral impressions, the two most common patient care items that rely on, de rely on dental laboratory support, carry a multitude of oral microorganisms originating from dental plaque, blood, and saliva. Some of these organisms are known to survive for up to seven days within prosthetic materials. So really take care. It says in here, one of the things you do about that, if you know they're kind of grody for a week, is thoroughly rinse the item under running water to reduce the amount of saliva, blood, blood microorganisms, bio burden. So rinse it off. After cleaning the item, use an EPA registered intermediate level hospital disinfectant to reduce the bio burden. So intermediate, intermediate disinfectant. On page two of enclosure four, there's a whole chart about different impression materials and agents. I'll be honest with you, I think there's a lot of other stuff that I could spend my time studying. Um, I don't think I've ever seen them ask the difference between polysulfide or silicone or polyether, some of these and like what specific agents you'd use. I mean, I see one that says zinc oxide and eugenol can only be cleaned of iodophores. So maybe that's important. Um, I think I'm probably gonna spend more time in the core manual where it looks at how many days like the peel packs and stuff can be sterile for. Cause I think this is some pop information where if I tried to overload it in my brain, there's other more important stuff that I should be studying instead. But that's on enclosure four, page two. Knock yourself out if that's something you wanna memorize. I do see a form in here for dental laboratory. So there is a work request that you have to put in called the DD form 2322 dental laboratory work authorization. One thing that I've noticed a lot of um, dental forms in general, there's a lot of twos in them. Same with the, the DDs and the um, just instruction numbers like this one is 6220.9B. And I know there's some other forms too, which when I cover medical records stuff, I'll cover that in more detail. But I noticed there tends to be a lot of two in dental probably with the SSIC and the organization stuff. So if I was to guess, and I have no idea, I would pick the one with the most twos in the number. Um, but again, this one is 2322, because two also kind of sounds like tooth. So 2322, Dental Laboratory Work Authorization. And that is the form that you use to transport something so it gets disinfected. Other stuff on here, unit dose. If it's a unit dose, only take what you need so you're not wasting materials. Um, there's also guides for how to clean stuff like pumice mix, ultrasonic cleaning unit. A lot of this stuff is super common sense. Like under the dental wax up, it says never use saliva to polish. So don't spit shine teeth stuff. Hand hygiene, clean your hands, super important. Again, as I said earlier, 15 seconds for this instruction. And that's it for the dental lab. Moving on for dental radiography. For this one, if it's single use, the bite block thingies when you're doing your x-ray, don't reuse them. Um, there are some that um, that you can reuse, but they need to be sterilized, but it looks like this says most of those are single use. You also use a disposable bite block cover for each patient, so don't reuse your bite block covers. And bite blocks must be cleaned and heat sterilized between patients if disposable covers are not available. Let's see. And that's really it for the enclosures at the end. Chapter four of the dental guide in the back just has references. Read that if you want. But again, I know they if it's a reference in a bib, they could test you stuff on it. But I think there's so many other areas that I could study on. I might just briefly read it and then focus on some of the instructions that are actually in the bib. For this cycle, I'm admittedly taking a late start. So I'm mostly gonna focus on the big things because I only got about two months in a week, not that I'm counting or anything. So again, thank you so much for watching my video. 
Please let me know if there's any things I can study, improve on, anything I need to do to make this better. For audio stuff, I don't really know how to work any of this. The, this is a $30 webcam and a uh, headset that I use for playing D&D and Pathfinder with my friends. So this is really something I'm just rigging up. So if you got any advice for cheap ways to make the quality stuff better, cool. I'll entertain it. Um, and again, thank you so much for the three people that's followed since the last video. Angel, Jesse, and Samantha, I really appreciate it. Please let me know if there's a way that I can help me and help you guys better. Let's go get that extra money. All right, take care.